Welcome, it's a great pleasure to be with you here. Thanks to, to King's for hosting this uh, lecture. Thank you, Andrew, uh, who apparently used to work for my uh, wife in Downing Street 20 years ago. Uh, when well, you must have been about 12, actually, looking at you now. But, um, and thank you for reminding me of my very first and wholly unsuccessful political outing, which was in Beaconsfield in 1982. It was memorable for two things, actually. First of all, my, my dad came and canvassed for me, and my dad had been a conservative all his life. And I had to reprimand him about halfway through the campaign when I found he was actually using the Conservative Party talking points on the doorstep rather than the, <laughs> the Labour ones. Um, and the other thing I remember was knocking on a door and, because uh, Beaconsfield was a very posh place, right? And I knocked on a door of a large house and the woman answered the door and I said, I'm from the Labour Party. She looked at me and then she shouted to her husband and said, darling, you must come and see this man. He says he's from the Labour Party. I've never seen one of those before. <laughs> and they then came and studied me as if I was some weird exhibit. And I said to her, well, do you think you might be voting Labour? And she said, oh, my dear, absolutely not. Uh, so that was, I lost that campaign, by the way, um, pretty comprehensively. So, um, 120 years old. I thought hard about taking stock on the Labour Party's 120th anniversary. It's not as if my uh, advice is particularly welcome to today's party. But then it, it occurred to me that there were actually only two people born in the last 120 years who have won an election for Labour. And alas, Harold Wilson is long gone. As for the other two leaders to have won an election, uh, Ramsay MacDonald was born in 1866 and Clement Attlee in 1883. So out of the 120 years, Labour has been in power for just over 30 of them. That is a stark statistic. We now have another Tory government for five years and possibly for 10. Were that to happen, Labour would have been in office for less than one quarter of its entire existence. Bluntly, what Labour has stood for in terms of values has been magnificent, its achievements in government huge, but as a political competitor, it has too often been a failure. It has only once been elected for two successive full terms, only once for three, both as new Labour, a period much of today's party wants to disown. As Glenn O'Hara shows in the excellent pamphlet on Labour history published today, during that 120 years, Labour has spent long stretches in opposition, elected spasmodically so the Conservatives could take a breather uh, before the natural order of things resumed, i.e. a Tory government. Labour, when it has won, has always won because it secured the centre of British politics, addressed the future, and broadened its appeal. And yet, despite this obviously being true, we've exhibited an extraordinary attachment to retreating into a narrow part of the left which has always ended in defeat. Then when defeated, we say, we will listen to the people. And for a short time, we do. Before we decide that what they're saying is too uncomfortable and lapse into our comfort zone, only to edge with agonized slowness back to where we should have been in the first place. Our latest defeat was entirely predictable and predicted. We went into the election with a, a leader with a minus 40%, minus 40% net approval rating on political terrain chosen by our opponents with a manifesto promising the earth, but from a planet other than earth, and a campaign which substituted a narcissistic belief in our righteousness for professionalism. So here we are back where we were before, and before that, and before that. And the public is watching the current leadership contest. I know it's not big news because that belongs to government, because governments do things and oppositions only say things. But the public have half an ear cocked. They're waiting to see if we get it. And they're willing us to succeed, by the way. They want a strong alternative. They know the country needs an opposition. And I know 
that when you're running for party leadership, you're talking to your activists, you're enthusing your base, you are carefully calibrating the confronting with the consoling, but we are in crisis. And at a time when progressive politics is in crisis virtually everywhere. See last night's debate in the US. In countries with populations of over 20 million, there is not one traditional left Western party in majority power, and few even in coalition. Progressives risk confining ourselves within four walls of impotence. Old style tax and spend, state power economics, foreign policy easily characterized as anti-Western, embrace of identity politics, and shouty denunciation of anyone who disagrees with us. The first misreads the lessons of the financial crisis. The second of post 9-11. The third sees us joining a culture war, which we are absolutely certain to lose if we do it. And the fourth encourages us to emulate the right-wing populists when our best weapon against them is to be the voice of reason and evidence. The Labour Party therefore faces challenges peculiar to its own history, magnified by the contemporary crisis of its global family. I honestly can't see any path forward other than fundamental reconstruction. So we could debate a myriad of detailed policies on social care, infrastructure, inequality, crime, education, health, north versus south, coastal versus cosmopolitan, new campaign techniques, social media, and all of them matter. But there are three overarching strategic challenges within which the answers to all of these must be found. Now, for brevity, I'm going to summarize them, though, frankly, each one of them is worth a book. And none of them work on their own. They have to be done together. First, we must build a new progressive coalition to put labor values into practice. We must correct the defect from our birth, which separated the liberal reforming traditions of Lloyd George, Beveridge, and Keynes from the labor ones of Hardy, Attlee, Bevan, and Bevan. These traditions became separated by ideas around class, industrial organization, the role of the state, and individual liberty, all of which ideas are time bound. But they had in common social reform, advancement of opportunity, passionate commitment to fighting poverty and injustice, all of which are timeless. How this is done institutionally, that's a matter for debate. But intellectually and philosophically, it is absolutely essential these two traditions are reunited. With one qualification. Those liberal politicians that I mentioned aspired to govern. Today's Lib Dems would have to show the same clarity of purpose. And remember, there are many progressives who presently do not feel at home in either political party or in any political party. Secondly, if labor becomes simply more moderate and less extreme, of course it will do better, but not much. The problem is that we have defined radical politics by a policy agenda which is hopelessly out of date, with moderate politics being just a milder version of it. We must redefine what radical means. We are living through a technology revolution, which is the 21st century equivalent of the 19th century industrial revolution. It will change everything, and therefore everything must change, including radical reorientation of government itself. This is the context in which we tackle inequality, promote social justice, and redistribute power and the context for urgent action on climate. One big change, green politics is no longer a single issue. It's an approach 
that is new to the whole of politics. But it needs a re-engineering of society and the economy which can't be left to the politics of street protest. What's more, the old labor market isn't coming back. Traditional solutions won't cure regional disparity, low productivity, stagnant wages amongst the section of the population, the communities, and the people left behind. We need a wholesale reimagining of the modern economy. But an old-fashioned left advocating old ways in a new world won't be trusted to do it. Which brings me to the third point. The right ideas in politics never work without the right mentality. By mentality, I mean the mentality of government. The Labour Party is not an NGO and not a pressure group. Its aim is not to trend on Twitter or to have celebrities, temporarily, by the way, fawn over it, or to glory in a bubble of adulation pricked by the sharp point of the first tough decision. Our task is to win power, to get our hands stuck into the muddy mangle of governing, where out of it can be pulled the prize of progress, measured not in fine words spoken at a distance, but in real grounded changes in the well-being of the people, some of which they may thank us for, and many of which they will never even know we're down to our struggle to place self-discipline over self-indulgence. Our mission is to take causes and make them practical, to say yes to ambition and no to over-ambition or the wrong ways of realizing it, to go to where the people are and show them, together, we can do better to root our actions in their reality, to align their values with ours. So those are the three things. <clears throat> They're profound changes to philosophy, policy, and practice. That is the scale of the remaking. What is going to make the next 120 years different from the first? And that is the big challenge, and a mountain bigger, frankly, than who's the next leader of the Labour Party. So I have taken stock. The conclusion, after yet another defeat, 120 years from our birth, is not a return to anything. 2020 isn't 1997 or even 2007. And 2030, by the way, will be a revolution different from 2020. It is always about the future. But it's precisely because of that. Because whilst pointing forwards, for too long we have been traveling backwards, Nothing less than a born-again, head-to-toe renewal will do for labor and for progressive politics. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I was interested, why do you think the Labour Party seems to hate being in power so much? Is it, is it, I mean, is there actually a sort of sense of the anti-establishment that people feel it's almost corrupting or <coughs> somehow dirty to be in government? Um, I think it's the, that, I mean, the Labour Party does want to be in power, but it's a cause. You know, and it's a cause that's about things like social justice and alleviation of poverty and helping those who can't help themselves. Whereas the Tory party's always been, its mission is to govern. You know, the Tory party, that's what they do. And unfortunately for us, they've done it quite successfully in terms of political competition over 200 years. But for us, it's always a cause. And therefore, what happens is, because politics in government is always about difficult decisions, messy compromises, step-by-step -step progress, you know, people on the progressive side, the labor side of politics, often feel that all of those things somehow undercut your principles. But of course, the obvious truth is, without being in power, your principles are pretty meaningless. Do you think labor really wants to win now? I think it does really want to win. The question is, does it, does it want to win enough so that it's prepared, one, to understand why it lost, and B, to make the changes necessary not to lose again? 
So the left would say new labor was the aberration, and now it's a return to true labor values. Why is that well, not right? I, I think one of the problems with labor is that it constantly misreads its own history. And one of the great things about uh, Glenn's pamphlet today is, is that it explains labor history. I mean, labor has only ever won as a <clears throat> center-left party, only ever. And so there are, you know, there's a great myth about the Attlee government that, you know, Clem Attlee and the people with him were sort of socialist revolutionaries. Clem had been the deputy prime minister to Churchill in the war years. The 1945 Labour government, in a sense, continued that. I mean, whenever you talk to people from abroad about 1945, the thing they say is, you guys are pretty ungrateful. I mean, Churchill won the war, and then you kick him out with a landslide for the Labour Party. And you have to explain to them, yep, but Churchill was fighting the war, Clement Attlee was looking after the domestic agenda, and basically there was a whole coming together. You know, the Education Act 1944, the National Health Service actually grew out of a whole lot of things that were already happening and being discussed and debated. And <clears throat> Clem Attlee, Ernie Bevan, Herbert Morrison, you know, these people were very much on the moderate side of politics. And then you go to Harold Wilson and you look at the 64 to 70 government, who were the big players? Harold Wilson, George Brown, Dennis Healy, Hoy Jenkins, you know, it's Jim Callaghan. I mean, they weren't exactly trots, you know, so it's, uh, the, the, the thing with the Labour Party is it, 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 it just, it has to understand its own history. Mm. It's never won when it's been parked in, in, on the far left, never. So what is it about that, the left wing <clears throat> politics that puts voters off? What is it that puts voters off? Um, well, nowadays it's an attachment to a form of state power that I just don't think people believe in in today's world. It's a foreign policy, as I say, that's kind of anti-Western. I think there's a real risk that progressive politics goes down a, this cul-de-sac of kind of identity politics. And, you know, it's, um, people don't like the sectarianism. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, I, I remember when I first became Labour leader, someone getting up at a meeting and saying to me in a very accusatory voice, right, I've been listening to you, and I've worked out what you're trying to do you're trying to get people who voted Tory to vote Labour. Um, and this is a, I said, well, yeah, I am trying to do that. And they were obviously disgusted by this. Um, but, you know, just take Labour's current predicament. Someone has decided after a lifetime of voting Labour to vote for the Tories and Boris Johnson. Right? You've got to get inside their head. Not your head, their head. So what do you think when to, uh, Labour MPs say <coughs> they'd never be friends with a Tory, you know, and denounce even some moderate Labour MPs as Tories? Yeah, well, you're just, you're just basically saying to the people who you need to win, we, we don't like you. Okay. Which is not a great start to a political conversation, <laughs> to be absolutely frank. I mean, but it's, you see, the trouble is it, it, it's all about, I mean, look, I understand when, when you're running for, for, for the leadership, and someone said this to me, a Labour Party member the other day, they said, look, you can't be too purist about this. You know, when you were running for the leader, you didn't throw clause four in there right up front in the faces of the party members. And, and that's true. Uh, and so I'm cut a lot of slack for the people fighting a leadership election now. You know, you're, you're in front of your, your, your activists, and I understand that. But I would say, when I was fighting for the Labour leadership, yes, it's true, I was careful, but no one was any, in any doubt the Labour Party was going to change if I got elected. Um, <clears throat> so I think the, the thing is you've got, to, you've got to really go to where people are. And you know, you've got to realize that any of us in the Labour Party are probably to the left of where most of the British public are. I mean, you know, that's, so your conversation has got to be in the real world with people who are, you know, living their lives and, and who've decided to reject you. And I think the, the important thing for Labour to understand about this last election is that the country, it, it didn't just decide not to elect us, it, it really shut the door in our face. 
do you think any of the candidates get that? Who, who do you think would be the best leader? <laughs> well, I, I don't want to damage anyone by supporting them, but um, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I've made up my mind. I'm not going to to, to to give an opinion on on which candidate. Look, I think <clears throat> basically there is an understanding in the Labour Party of this. You know, I think whatever happens is going to be a significant improvement. My the purpose in saying what I'm saying today, which you know will irritate some people in, in the Labour Party and in the leadership, I'm sure, is just to say, <clears throat> you've always got to watch how politics moves on. You see, at the last election, if we suddenly got rid of Jeremy Corbyn and put in someone more moderate, I think we'd have done a lot better at this last election. I think the country would have said, well, you, you, you're getting it? OK, we're going to give you five, five years' time. It's not enough just to be moderate. Because the Tories will have five years of government. They're going to try and establish a real political hegemony. Um, and our voters, once they voted Tory for the first time, you know, that first time is tough for them. Second time might be easier for them. You've got to watch that. So, that's why what I'm saying is when you really look objectively at our position, fundamental reconstruction is what you need. Now, I don't think you can tell whether any of the leadership people or the people likely to win are, are going to do that or not right now. But I'm just saying when you look, if you take a hard, long look at the Labour Party today, you'd have to say its problem is serious and fundamental. And if you can't get that far, your risk is that people at the next election say, well, we told you what to do, and you just didn't do it. So this time, we're actually finding it easy to vote Tory. So you think those votes that Boris Johnson says are just loans to the Tories could be given in places like Sedgefield? I mean, how did you feel when you saw Sedgefield? It's horrible. It's terrible. I mean, I've, I felt terrible, first of all, for my successor, Phil Wilson, who's a great guy, really lovely person, and d did a good job. And, and I felt, but most of all, I feel angry when the Labour Party refuses to do what is necessary. Because you've got a Tory government now that, that basically doesn't, it, it's, it's not going to feel any restraint from having a successful opposition. You know, Tories are not going to be sitting there wondering, oh dear, what about the Labour Party? Not yet, at any rate. So when you don't have a viable opposition that's competitive, you also permit the government to do whatever it wants to do. So, and in our case, there'll be things that are, are going to be very difficult for the country, I think. Will those votes come back to Labour? Yeah, of course they can come back to Labour. Um, but we have to show we've listened. And what do you think was more to blame? Jeremy Corbyn, Brexit, or the manifesto? <laughs> well, let's say the three in combination were unusually difficult. Uh, I think it was the whole thing. You see, with Brexit, so I have this debate a lot, a lot of people, and some very reasonable people who will make a very reasonable point to people like me, and they'll say, look, we should have just gone for a soft Brexit compromise. Uh, we might have got that through Parliament, and you know that would have been a way out of Brexit. Now, I personally don't think that is correct, but I think it's a very serious argument. So on the Brexit side of things, I'm willing to really listen to what people are saying about it. My point is this, and I think <clears throat> in a curious way, Boris Johnson and I have the same position which is I don't think you can ever unite the country over Brexit. You can unite them after Brexit. So if we'd stopped Brexit, <clears throat> which I think we could have done, if we'd had a serious opposition, I would have said you immediately then have to deal with all the problems that gave rise to Brexit that people were voting. So you'd have had to have taken a whole series of measures to make sure you were pulling those people back towards you, having, in a sense, alienated them by not doing Brexit. And I think what Boris Johnson is doing is he's wrapping it around the other way. He's saying, we're going to do Brexit, but now we're going to reach out to all these northern places, and, and, and we're going to bring those Brexit people, um, you know, we're going to try and keep, keep them with us. Now, so I think if the Labour Party had taken a strong position on Brexit and said to the country, look, we're going to give the government um, the chance to negotiate an agreement, if they come up with a bad agreement, we're going to say that it should be put back to the people. I think if they'd said that right from the very beginning, I'd, I think we would have got through it. Yes, we'd have lost some people, but we'd have kept others. But to be in the situation of where you, I mean, it was a bizarre policy, right? We were going to negotiate this agreement with Europe, a 
and then we were going to have a referendum on it where we couldn't actually say either to the Europeans or indeed to the country which way we'd vote. I don't think that, that wouldn't have been an easy negotiation. And do you think now Labour should be campaigning to rejoin? No. Okay. You just can't, I'm afraid. Look, long term, who knows? But, and the Tories will own Brexit, whatever happens. <clears throat> but you've got to give it a chance to be done. Now, I think the government will face, I think it is, it's not clear to me the degree to which this is all saber rattling and, you know, people are just kind of putting themselves out there to, <clears throat> in the pre negotiation. If the government, really wants to diverge significantly from European regulation, though they'll, they'll have a very tough negotiation. And um, I only hope they are correcting the biggest mistake of the Theresa May negotiation. The biggest mistake was making political statements without technical analysis. I mean, Brexit is at one level a very technical thing. Trade agreements are technical. And by the way, the thing about trade agreements, as anyone who's got experience of government knows, is Everyone, it's a bit like reform. Everyone's in favor of trade agreements. In principle, everyone is in favor. It's just when you get to the detail, it's bloody difficult. So I think if the government, if the government isn't doing the technical work, it's gonna be a problem. But I, I've got to assume that they, they will, and so I, I can't tell what's gonna happen with it. But there's no point in, the, the Labour Party should just be critiquing what the government's doing from a sensible position, but there's no point in it. The, the country does not want, in the short term at any rate, to read about Brexit. And do you think Rebecca Long Bailey <coughs> was right that Jeremy Corbyn should be given 10 out of 10? <laughs> Supposing you just guess the answer to that <laughs> rather than me give it. Okay. Just explain why you might think she's wrong. <clears throat> well, they're not, you know, for the British people, they, they, have never voted for that type of far left politics. And for the people in constituencies like mine, patriotism is like number one thing, right? Or it's not necessarily number one, no, that's not the right way of putting it. It's preconditional, right? You may, you may decide your vote on the basis of the health service, but if you've got any doubts about patriotism, and that is just forget it. And I'm afraid people just had a lot of doubts. So the manifesto, the, the Corbyn supporters would say the policies are very popular, you know, people like them, they polled well. Yeah. What, what went wrong there? Well, it'd be odd if they really liked them if we lost. Mm. Uh, I've never quite got this one, actually, which is they really liked our policies, they really wanted them, they really hated the Tory policies, and I don't know, they just voted Tory. Uh, no, they, they did not like the policies. Uh, individual policies, you see, there's this thing... It's the thing about individual policies and polling. It's, it's, the, it's why I always used to say to people, and I learned this through the 1980s and 90s, which is the fallacy of polling individual policies and thinking you're learning something. Because when you're polling an individual policy, first of all, you're separating it from the, the whole, and in the end, it's the whole thing that people vote on. So you can take individual policies and each one of them might be popular, but you put them all together and it's not popular. Okay. But secondly, when you poll individual policies, it's why I call the difference between a three-second conversation, a 30-second conversation, and a three-minute conversation. Right, so railway renationalization. Three-second conversation, yeah, yeah, no, it should be in public ownership. 30-second conversation, you're gonna spend a lot of time on renationalizing the railways and it could cost quite a lot of money, and you've got all the things to do with pension funds and so on. 30 second conversation, yeah, no, well, maybe. Three minute conversation. Here are the big challenges in transport going forward. You're gonna have um, driverless vehicles, electric cars, you're gonna have to reimagine the entire infrastructure of the country, and you guys are gonna be spending all your time on railway renationalization. Three minute conversation, I think that's a very good idea, actually. You, you poll individual policies, it doesn't, you know, you go back to the 1980s, by the way, all Labour's policies, apart from unilateral nuclear disarmament, were popular. I remember, I, this is why I sat and studied this during the 1980s, because I couldn't work it out at first. I was reading these polls saying privatization was really unpopular, trade union law was really unpopular, tax cuts at the top end were really unpopular, so how come Margaret Thatcher kept winning by a landslide? I spent a lot of time puzzling this, and I, these are the two conclusions I came to. In the end, it's about the whole thing, 
And it's a fallacy to think that individual policies can be pulled and separated in that way. And so I think most people, look, they, they said what they said. I mean, it's clear. And by the way, virtually every single person who's done independent reviews of what happened in the election has said the same thing. People thought the manifesto was incredible. Hmm. And if it's incredible, it's not a good idea. Because, you know, especially if you're living, living a really tough life and someone promises you the earth, it's just, it's not a credible thing. And so I don't, I, no, it was, no, the, the manifesto wasn't, it, well, A, it wasn't popular, and B, it was wrong. I mean, the most important thing is that it was, it was wrong. You know, this is why I made this point about the technology revolution. The challenge for progressive politics today is to recognize the sheer scope and scale and speed of that revolution. It's going to change everything. And it's going to mean, a, as I say, a huge re-engineering. If, if you want to take green politics seriously, you're going to have to reimagine the economy. Right? Now, the people who will be trusted to do that are people who, one, understand the future, understand what's going to happen, and two, are prepared to help you through it but in a forward and modern-oriented way. They're never going to trust people who believe in sort of old-style collectivism to help them through that. So that's, you know, if I was back in frontline politics today, the first thing I would do is just get us to re rethink policy from first principles. What are the huge changes that are going to happen in our country and in other modern developed countries in the next few years? The left always wins when people think they need a government on their side helping them, right? So how is that government going to be constituted? How are you going to manage to make sure that industry prepares for digitalization, <clears throat> that your healthcare system gets reformed, education system, law and order, um, as a result of technological change? How is that going to happen? Who are the types of people you need to form alliances with in order to get those answers right? And that's, you know, that's where the future is going to be decided. So this is, it, it's a, the problem with the manifesto is that it, it, it wasn't popular, but it also just wasn't, you know, so you have a debate about the health service in this country today, which the Labour Party should just get, get way above it. The debate is basically the Tories say, we're under lots of pressure on health. By the way, they, this is what they always say. We're under lots of pressure on health, we'll throw some more money at it. Labor says, however much money you spend on the health service, whatever it is, we're going to double it. That's the debate. You could have had that debate in the 1980s, and we just had it in 2019. What we've got to be saying is, let's reimagine the health service today with all the changes that are necessary. Now, if we do that, then when we're saying we're going to invest in the healthcare system, people say, yeah, but these guys know that we've got to do this differently. That's why you know, one of the things that we did do when I was in government, by the time I left office, you know, health service satisfaction was at its highest rating since the health service began, because we were prepared not just to invest, but to make changes. There is a new dimension to politics, which is this whole culture war thing, that, which you mentioned a couple of times. Do you think, when you were in government, you did a lot on gay rights. Do you see transgender rights as the new frontier, or do you worry that that's going too far? It's a big, been a big issue in the leadership contest, obviously. So you've got to distinguish between the advocacy of certain things that are right, and you can say that about whether it's about gay rights, transgender rights, whatever it is. You've got to distinguish between that <clears throat> and launching yourself politically into a kind of culture war with the right. So <clears throat> if you go transgender rights is our big thing, and the right goes immigration controls is our big thing, you're going to lose that war. You're going to lose that. So you're not going to advance any of the things you want to do. So we don't need to be fighting that culture war. That doesn't mean to say you don't take the right positions on things. So would you sign this pledge, for example, if you were No, for... I wouldn't. Why not? Because I think there are all sorts of difficult issues that have to be resolved. There's a proper consultation that's going on, and we should do it in that way. But if you're going out there and you're going to start trying to advocate things, this is what the last point I was making, in a kind of finger-jabbing, sectarian way, you know, you don't sign up to what I'm saying, then I'm going to come and disrupt your meetings and shout at you. You're not going to win that battle. You're just going to put a whole lot of people off. So it's, and it's another thing about the left that, 
One of the other problems of that manifesto, I actually read it, by the way, I don't know how many people did, but I read it. It's 97 pages, I think it was. And the more you read it, the less convinced you became. It was an incredible document. Because on every page, you could see someone had come and knocked on the door and said, hey, here's a 10-point plan on this, and I want a billion pounds. Yeah, OK. Let's put that in there. And then the next page, another 10-point plan, another billion. So what people worry about, they want to know that if they're, and they want to know this far more than they do about the Tory party, because as I say, they understand the Tory party's purpose is to govern the Labour party's accords. So what they want to know about a Labour party leader is that in the end, he or she is in charge. Right? They're in charge, and yes, pressure groups will be listened to, yes, trade unions will be listened to, but they're in charge. Because otherwise, what they fear is precisely what that manifesto ended up with. So everybody who shouts or disrupts or throws something, you know, yeah, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll give it to you as well. I mean, people So being in charge that. means saying no. Yeah. Look, the test, any politician can say yes. It's pretty easy. <laughs> it's when you say no, particularly to your own people. But <clears throat> I may be wrong on this, but I think with progressive politics particularly, the public wants to know that whoever is the leader, that person is prepared to say no to their own folk. Because they know it's a cause, and therefore because they always worry that you're going to be you know, playing to your activist base, you know, this I think is going to become, by the way, a huge problem for the Democrats in the US, but that's another sad story. What do you think should happen there? Do you, are you worried that some, they're going to make the same mistake with... Sanders that Labour made with Corbyn. Well, I, you know, it's, it's uh, as I always say when I'm uh, in America, someone asks me who I'm back, I say, I've got enough problems in my own politics without <laughs> getting into yours. But, um, but I would take a pretty careful look at the Labour Party if I was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Let's put it like that. And what about Bloomberg? Do you think he's the answer? No, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> I suppose that, um, the big question is whether, you know, you talk about the centre being the solution, but actually the Lib Dems did terribly at the election. Do you think actually perhaps the centre isn't the answer anymore? Perhaps people are looking for clear, more clarity and uh, more radical answers. Well, you can be clear and radical and still in the centre. Mm. Um, look, I think the problem for the Lib Dems was that, you know, to be very honest about it, it they, for a few months, it looked as if they were, they were going to become the real deal, and then they just became Lib Dems again. <laughs> and why was that? I don't know. I don't know why they did that, but I mean, they really did. It was just tragic to watch. Um, what do you mean by that? You mean they... Uh, you know what I mean, really, don't you? You know what I mean. No, just it's... That's the thing. It's, look, I don't think the centre, in the sense of a strong centre, has been on offer. I think if it was on offer, it would do really well. I think, in any event, you know, <laughs> I would suggest it's about time to try it again. <laughs> so does that mean a new party? No, it doesn't mean a new party, but I think, and, and I said in the speech, I don't know institutionally what happens. I think the most important thing is to debate the scale of the challenge and the principles that should govern it. And then I think you've got to see, but I think anything could happen in British politics. Because I think... You know, the, the risk for the Labour Party, let's be clear, is that it, you know, the Tories will make, governments make mistakes, they get into trouble, there are scandals, there's this, there's that. You know, you could find a situation where the Labour Party thinks it's doing well because the Tories start to go down in the polls, you know, the old by-election, the sort of local council results. You know, late 85, early 86, Margaret Thatcher and the Tories were in terrible trouble. You know, if, if I ever want to, to um, reconnect with a certain humility about my own predictive capacity, I actually used to keep a political diary at that time. And my entry for January 1986 was, you know, we're going to win the next election. We actually lost by a landslide. So my worry for the Labour Party is that it kind of looks as if we're doing better, but we haven't made the fundamental changes. And then what you find is that, you know, when you then get into the election, what, what, happens in, in, what happens in government is that people basically say, most of the time, 
I'm going to assess the government against the perfect government. Right. In, the, in the years that, the, right, in the first, in between election times, it's, do I like this government as opposed to the government in my dreams, which is the government that gets everything right and no difficult decisions and blah, blah, blah. Okay. But then you get back into the election again, and then they say, no, actually, I, I understand it's not a perfect, it's, it's the other government. So it's this government versus that government. And then, of course, everything, suddenly the thing evens up again. So if you haven't, if the public has fundamentally rejected us now, and we don't fundamentally change, we're going to kid ourselves two years in that we're doing better than we're really doing, because they're not really thinking about us as a government. And then you get into the election, and suddenly, you know, you're back to, you're back to where we were in 87. So when you talk about a realignment, do you mean a formal alliance with the Lib Dems? bringing the, as you discussed at one point, I literally Paddy. don't know at this okay. stage. It could go in a number of different directions. Um, but I do know you've got to deal with this defect that's been with us for a long time. Because the 120 years is an important thing. It's, it's not in 2019 we did badly. In 120 years, and let's take it 125, maybe 130, if you've been in power for less than a quarter of your existence, I mean, you've got to, you've got to say that no, it's not just a temporary problem. Now, I think what's happened is, I mean, basically what New Labour was, was an attempt to reunite those Liberal and Labour wings. Now, we did it in different parties, but myself and Paddy Ashdown were kind of in a, you know, in a kind of informal alliance together. And that meant that we broadened our appeal, and that's why we won the three elections. But what then happened was, we then retreated from that by stages, and then under the Corbyn leadership, we really retreated into a narrow part of Labour, I mean, not, not even a big part of labor. So <clears throat> that, you've got to throw that, that whole thing open again. Um, and you've got to, to, to recognize, I think, the importance of this, the environment and, and green politics, as I say. I mean, I didn't have time to kind of develop this argument. But I do think the biggest change that's happened since I left office is that this understanding of the environmental threat and how to deal with it is, is now, I think, fundamental, not just as a single issue, but as a whole politics. So 120 years on, do you, how much danger is the Labour Party in? Do you think this is a sort of make or break moment and that it could die if, if they choose the wrong leader? Well, it's a make or break moment for sure. Yeah. And, and my point is we should use the occasion because the one thing you do get in, is, in opposition is, is, is leisure time. <laughs> you get a lot of that. So you might as well think. I mean, that's what I spent. I mean, I spent all the years from 83 and 94 thinking. You know, a lot of the time was just thinking. So if you think about it, you've got a long-term problem and you've got an immediate problem. And you've got to think your way through both of those things. And you've got to get the big philosophical and intellectual structures right around the answers to those questions. And if you do, you can, if you do, you could win the next election. But if you don't, then y your risk is that you, you end up, you know, too strong to disappear, but too weak to win. Right. OK, I'm going to open up to questions now. Does um, John, I'm going to take three, and then Tony can answer. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm John McTernan. I'm a recovering political advisor. Um, so you, one of the challenges that you have, you didn't touch on, is the, we're an aging society, and that's there's going to be big demands on social care, dementia care, when people live to 100. There's an approximate political issue now, which is the government is seeking to restrain migration in ways which will maybe hit the health sector, the social care sector. What are both the big picture challenges for progressive politics and social care, and how would you handle the politics of constraining migration and its impact on the, the care sector? And then there's two questions over there. Thanks, I'm Dr. Paul Sagar, lecturer in the Department of Political Economy. I voted for Ed Miliband in 2010, and I bitterly regret having done so. And I'm wondering to what extent you think the pattern you described may in fact have been much closer to being broken, namely if his brother David had won instead. And then there was one question there, yeah. 
Hi, uh, Rania, Chair of Labour Students. Um, just in terms of the sectarianism that you spoke about, do you think that can be solved or dealt with within a culture and a society where we have very fast news and social media? How do we work with both of those factors and still tackle sectarianism? Yeah, okay. and there's three very good questions. I mean, I... So I think social care is... Um, probably the, the most difficult uh, policy question um, because the, the impact and the expense of it is going to get greater and there is an urgent need to reintegrate that with the rest of, of, of healthcare. And I think, you, you know, for some of these things, by the way, you should just get the very best people to come together and see if you can work out the right way through it. Although I also think technology has got the potential to change that in a huge way as well. And you're absolutely right that you, we will need a migrant population to help with this. So you have, in a, in a sense, um, this clash between an older population, probably that's often very hesitant around immigration, with this urgent need for migration. And I think the biggest problem with what the government's announced just in the last couple of days will be you know, the assumption that there are all these um, British people who, you know, are desperate to get into these jobs and just haven't found their way there. Um, now, I think you can deal with the migration problem, but only if you're clear that you want controlled immigration. And this is a very difficult thing from the left. I, I, we published a pamphlet recently from my institute in which we said we needed, you know, we need to make sure people integrated. Um, and we suggested a biometric identity card so you know exactly who has a right to be here and who has a right not to be here. And people forget the 2005 election, the Tories wanted to fight it on immigration. We had to answer their positions on it. If you, are, you show that you have sensitivity towards people's anxieties about immigration, you can then make the case for immigration. But if you are simply saying, well, we're not, we're not you know, even to, even to engage in that debate is, is either racist or you're, you know, we were accused as an institute of, you know, blaming immigrants for their problems. You're just going to lose that battle altogether. So, I mean, that's a classic example of whether you want to win or you don't want to win. <laughs> you know, if, you, if, if there is real anxiety, you have to deal with the reasonable anxieties in order to be able to make the case for, for migration. And then you can make the case as to why you're going to need this migration in order to deal with some of the problems we have. And that, I think, is the only way of doing it. In 2010, yeah, I think there will be, there are going to be, um, or maybe there already are, PhD theses written about the significance of the 2010 Labour Party result. Um, I mean, I have to say, by the way, I got on perfectly well with Ed and like him as a person, but I think um, it was a very significant moment, I'm afraid, for the Labour Party. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I want to say on that. Um, Sectarianism, yet yeah. you see, you see, my, I think social media is a revolutionary phenomenon. By the way, it, it just changes everything, and it's changed politics. And it's a very sensible question, which is to say, it's all very well to say you don't want sectarianism, but actually, social media kind of works through that, <laughs> and. But what I would say is, it does, but you've got to put some faith in the people not necessarily liking it, even though it's a big part of their lives. So I always say to be one of the first things you learn in politics is that those who shout loudest don't necessarily deserve to be heard most. It's a very important lesson. And social media is, by I mean, is shouty stuff, right? I think we would do better if we're the calm voice of reason for us. Not necessarily the right wing, by the way, because they operate in a different way, particularly today. But that's what I think. But I agree, it's difficult. But you can't, <clears throat> you know, you've got, to, um, you've got to reckon with the fact that most, you know, most people are pretty normal, I think. I mean, social media has taught you that there's a lot more people who aren't. 
out there than you ever thought before. I mean, it's true. Because, you know, sometimes you read the social media stuff, do you think, oh, my God, I mean, really? You know, but it's, I don't think the majority of people think like that. And I also think, again, they quite like leaders who stand up against it. Do you think the party needs to expel <coughs> more um, hardliners, m momentum, things like that? I don't think they just need to defeat them. I mean, these people, look, the thing, the thing, the thing that happened in the Labour Party, because those of us, many people here are too young to remember this, but those of us who fought these battles in the late 70s, early 80s, what basically happened was that there was a whole kind of, and, you know, Jeremy Corbyn and John Donald came in on the wave of this, which was to take the Labour Party in a far left position, and Tony Benn was at the time the, the you know, he was a brilliant politician in many, many ways, was the, was the great architect. So that, that was a sort of all-out assault <clears throat> on the sort of citadel of labor politics. And in the end, because by a fra fraction, Dennis Healy beat Tony Benn for the deputy leadership, it was repulsed. And people forget this. I mean, I first came across Michael Foote when he was the leader of the Labour Party, and I was a young lawyer, acting for the Labour Party and for Michael Foote in the expulsion of militant. Right, so Michael Foote, okay, was on the left, but he wasn't on the far left, right? And then what happened was basically, after that, under Neil Kinnock, then under John Smith, then under me, you know, the door was pretty much locked and bolted to the far left, right? And what happened from 2015 onwards is the door was open with a welcome mat. So all of these people have poured in. Now, I'm not suggesting you're going to expel them all, but you're gonna to have to, in the end, they're gonna to have to realize they're not going to govern the Labour Party anymore, because if they do, we just <clears throat> carry, on, carry on losing. Um, I mean, you should obviously expel people who are anti-Semitic and this type of thing, but you know, even with anti-Semitism, the anti-Semitism arises from a worldview. You don't defeat that worldview, it's just going to hang around there. And people may be more disciplined in what they put out on social media, for example, but it's, they're, they're going to be thinking the same things. I think it's probably time for one more question, Tim. So. Uh, my name is Tim Bale, and I, I teach um, politics at Queen Mary University, and I am also deputy director of UK and Changing Europe. But the question isn't about Brexit; it's about the fact that the. Uh, Labour Party now has over half a million members and I wondered um, to what extent you thought in the re-engineering of progressive politics that you're talking about, whatever institutional form it takes, whether those members can be converted into an asset rather than what some people think they've become, which is a liability to change in the Labour Party. Yeah. Should we just do one? Have we got... Yeah, we can do it. Okay, do Let's you do a couple more? Do one more. Thank you. Uh, Kate McCann from Sky News. Uh, Mr. Blair, there are a number of candidates in this leadership election who have policies designed to make it difficult to intervene in conflicts abroad. Given the current situation in Syria, how do you feel about that? Um, on the last one, I mean, one of the great advantages of no longer being. Um, the leader of the Labour Party or Prime Minister is you can just sometimes say, I'm not getting into that today. Um, and that's one of the ones I'm not getting into today. Um, the Labour Party and its membership. So <clears throat> when we took over the leadership of the Labour Party in 1994, we actually, there was a huge uplift in the members. Um, and I'm not saying that the members don't generate a huge amount of enthusiasm, and they do. But the problem is the membership of the Labour Party. The membership of the Labour Party tends to follow its leadership. And into the Labour Party, as I said a moment ago, have come all those people from the far left. And here's the honest truth about it. They will divide into two groups. They will divide into one group that basically are people who just want, they want radical change, you know, they want social justice, they want the Labour Party to be not just managing the status quo, but changing it, but they're essentially people that, yes, you can convert those into an asset. And then I'm afraid you get the people who actually really are from the sectarian far left, 
And I'm not sure there's much you can do with them, because they're not an asset, I'm afraid. Um, and the trouble is, this is the most difficult thing in, in, in the, the leadership, because you know, having gone through all this process before, and I think today is much more difficult than it was in 1983, much, much more difficult. But having gone through all this process before, the first thing everyone says is, we all got to uni unite. And I worked out over time that actually the first thing you've got to do is decide. You can unite after you decide. But if you've got two groups of people who fundamentally disagree, and I think there is a fundamental disagreement with the sectarian hard left and the Labour Party, as it has been traditionally, I think you've got to decide first. Then you can think about how you unite. And the other thing I'd say is that, you know, I think the whole concept of membership and parties is, is going to change as well in, in the years to come. And we're going to have to build a whole new progressive alliance. I mean, I think this, this question of what is the new progressive coalition is a really important question to, 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 to answer. And the truth is that you know, that part of the membership of the party today that comes from that sectarian part of politics that some of us you know, remember so well from the late 70s and early 80s, they're always going to pull you to these unrealistic positions. They're always, I mean, how could we go into an election, which we just did, with a whole lot of reselections hanging over MPs? So when you need them to be out on the doorstep engaging with the public, they're fighting trench war battles in their local constituency parties. I don't, I don't know how you, you reconcile that. So yes, there are people in it who, who, who are an asset. But one of the things that's going to have to happen when we get new leadership is you're going to have to try and bring new people into the Labour Party. And one final thing just to say because this is the, 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 it's always the challenge of progressive politics. You cannot end up being obliged to have one conversation when you're talking to your party and another conversation when you're talking to the public. That is the end, right? And I, you know, what I always wanted to do with the Labour Party is to get to the point where you're having the same conversation. Because then, by the way, you're pulling into the Labour Party the broad mass of people who might support your positions. But if you end up in a situation <clears throat> where you're getting rounds of applause from your activists and the public's out there thinking, oh my god, what's this? And that's where we've been. That's, by the way, that is absolutely the risk of the Democrats in the US now. And the other thing just to say is <clears throat> progressive politics worldwide right now <clears throat> in the West, I mean, it's an extraordinary thing. You go around the world, no majority <clears throat> traditional left party in power. You go around Europe today, <clears throat> you look at traditional left parties in France, in Germany, virtually anywhere actually in Europe, Italy. You know, they're, they're, they're like kind of defunct almost. So I think this is a big challenge for progressive politics. This is why I say, you know, for the Labour Party, what I'd like to see once you get the, look, I understand leadership election is going to take whatever course it takes. <clears throat> once you do that, we need, <clears throat> excuse me, we need a huge debate in which the Labour Party should be reaching out to other progressive parties. They should be engaging with people, engaged in progressive politics right around the Western world. And we start, we start to figure it out. And the conclusion I have come to is, is one thing, and I, I may be wrong in this, by the way, but it's, 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 this is the conclusion I've come to, which is around this technology revolution. Now, I find it a very difficult thing, because you have this conversation with people in politics, and they will say to you, yeah, yeah, no, it's really interesting, all that technology. Now let's talk about politics. And I think it's the biggest thing. It's the biggest opportunity. It's the biggest challenge. It's the biggest route to creating a different type of society and a better one, and it's the biggest obstacle if it, if it is not handled correctly. So that's what I think. And I think that where progressive politics revives itself is positioning itself absolutely in the future, building a broad alliance of people who understand, you know, of course you need a competitive private enterprise and you need 
mechanisms of social justice, but all of that is being enveloped by this huge change that's happening, like the 19th century Industrial Revolution, you know, by the way, which it took politics decades to catch up with. And that's where we should center ourselves. But this is the debate we need to have. And if the debate is simply about you know, whether you renationalize rail or you don't, or energy and water, or whether you even abolish tuition fees, you don't abolish. This is, this is hopeless. If, the, if, if we stay in this position, then the biggest risk for progressive politics is the right wing just carry on winning by default because there's not a viable progressive alternative, and they determine the future. And by the way, they won't determine it well because in the end, they don't care in the same way that we do about making sure that things work for the broad mass of people. That's just the difference. That's why I would never be a Tory and I'm in the Labour Party. So this is the big challenge, and I think Honestly, whatever happens with the party membership, you know, we're going to have to sort that out, I think, in time. But what I want to see, not just in the Labour Party, but across progressive politics, is big questions being posed and answers, a proper debate. And in that, these sectarian people, the problem with them is they always want to denounce you before they want to debate you. And we need people who are prepared to debate and not denounce. Thank you very much, and thanks to everyone for coming.